So <clears throat> we're going to talk this morning about the topic is education for life for the world. Um, I've had a couple of years now where I haven't been in the classroom with students every day, which uh, actually gave me time to think about, well, what do, what do we do? <laughs> and how does, it, how does it happen? Because when you're in the classroom, you're, just, you're kind of on, on intuitive mode, and it just you're just moving through things. And uh, to have a chance to sit, step back and look and try to be able to explain it to a broader audience is, uh, has been a real um, special time for me. As everybody knows, Education for Life grew out of a, a strongly spiritual focus uh, started by Paramahamsa Yogananda in India 100 years ago. The uh, main book, uh, Education for Life, is written by his direct disciple, J. Donald Walter, Swami Kriyananda. And most of the people, uh, if not all, of the early teachers were disciples. They were devotees of, of a particular spiritual path. However, that is only the fir first beginning of this whole work because this work is meant to help the whole world. It's meant to help people who, no, they, don't, they really don't think of themselves as spiritual seekers even, or they don't think of themselves specifically as wanting to, uh, you know, find God or any of those things. And when you s step back from education for life, you can start to see how that can work. And that's what we're going to go through this morning, looking at these aspects from a slightly different perspective. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was, well, how does education for life, what is really its significance? How is it special um, in terms of what else is offered up there? What do we have to add to the conversation about education around the world? There are uh, wonderful programs out there that we can use and we can make use of. There are wonderful curriculums that have been developed uh, in different ways that make a lot of sense. They flow nicely. They have lots of beautiful balance to them. They engage students. And uh, we certainly want to uh, work with those people and contribute to that direction. But that's not really our essence. Uh, there are other places up there that really develop this idea of um, station learning, special individualized learning. And I've done a great job. Um, Maria Montessori's work, especially in that area. And it's another thing that we want to take advantage of. We want to use those things and make, make use of them in terms of which, what feels right to a particular teacher. But what makes us special uh, is this whole idea of connecting with the individual child. And that's where I want to start this morning. It, in itself, it's not also, it's not, we're not the only ones that do that. Um, Lots of people talk about it and do it. However, sometimes the doing of it gets lost in, um, I don't know, kind of, a, kind of a more rigid mentality. I remember I was watching this one classroom once where obviously the teacher had been trained to connect with every single child every single morning. And so I was, got there before class started and the you know, uh, school time started and he, was, he stood, went over and stood by the door and he shook each child's hand as they came in. And I think he even said something to them. But his eyes were wandering around the room. They were looking over here, over there. I don't think he made eye contact with a single child in that whole line. But he had done the outward part. He was you know, honoring each child's individuality. But there wasn't the connection. And what the connection wasn't being made. With the children, too, you could see they weren't connecting as they walked in. And what we want to focus on here is what is that connection we're looking for? And how do we, how do we get that? One word that comes to mind immediately is love. You could say because you're trying to exchange on that level, a heart level with a child. However, even the word love gets skewed because there's an overprotective love. There's a love that's, you know, that has a whole lot of um, kind of I love you because I feel so good when I love you or something like that. It's just, it's still me-centered in terms of the teacher. It's not there for the child. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage situations where the teacher is present for the child without any agenda. There's nothing we're trying to teach them. There's nothing we're trying to do. We're just trying to be there and give that child the chance to be, to be 
honored is I guess the best word I can come up with. It's just that for who they are. They don't have to prove anything to us. They don't have to change themselves. They don't have to do anything. They just have to be present. They just have to be there. And that's the starting place for education for life. It's that moment where we can have that kind of a connection with the, with the student. The, I know I was talking with, uh, with Helen about how they uh, set up their school year at, in uh, Palo Alto. And I really like the, what, the, what they do there. They have a week before classes start where the teacher's in the classroom and each child comes in, in separately. And they have this chance to just be in the classroom, talk to the teacher informally, find out how the thing, place works. And I know this is something that um, also a lot of the Montessori schools have incorporated that, that approach. But I just want to encourage schools to, because it helps, it helps the process. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It depends, again, on the teacher. Is the teacher going to be busy with their lesson plans and you, know, you fit here and you fit here and you know, not really connect with the child? Or are, they, or are the teachers going to take that time and just say, who are you? <laughs> what, do you what do you like to do? What would you like to see happen in school this year? And just draw, draw that child into the center of the focus and help them to feel that they're the center, that they, the classroom exists because of them. <laughs> and that everything that happens in that classroom, hopefully, will be trying to draw them, draw them in, draw them out, uh, make it, take advantage of the, any talents or interests that they have, and just uh, build that the classroom becomes, they, they're part of the co-creation of the whole classroom process. We'll get into a little bit later this morning. They don't, they don't own the place. It's not all of their things that were, I mean, they're not going to determine everything that happens in that classroom, but we want them to feel like they're contributors, that they're contributors to that. So we're going to um, look at that a little bit more. Now, I was teasing uh, Kashama, who used to be Erica, because I was going to start to tell some stories about this. And then at uh, Spiritual Renewal Week, which we just had, she was one of the speakers on Wednesday, and she started telling her stories about this <laughs> exact topic. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> you know what the next step is? Next step is everybody has stories about this. And that's why you're sitting in groups of five. Um, because I'm going to ask you at this point to turn your chairs to your people you're sitting with and talk about this experience of both giving this, experience, this uh, opportunity to a child could be, well, actually it's to anybody. We're, we work with children, so we specialize in children, but it could be anybody. But just, that was what the topic was actually on uh, Wednesday. It was taking relationships to the higher octave, which is basically just honoring the essence of who you're talking to. You could call it essence of self, you could call it a soul, you could call it whatever you want to call it, but it's just like, who is this? Who are these people? Now, so one perspective is to talk about you as the person who's trying to create that space. What have, you, what's hap what have you experienced in your own uh, education or interaction with children? But the other one is your own pers personal experience of that growing up. Did anybody do that for you? <laughs> Did anybody make you feel like you were, you were fine just the way you were and you were accepted and appreciated and you didn't have to prove it and you felt relaxed and you felt like you could just be yourself? Or did you live in a situation where everybody was always trying to make you fit some kind of a schedule or some kind of a priority list of, that they're making, which is what usually happens in education. Children comes in, first thing is, you don't know how to read. Well, all right, you're gonna read, and as soon as you get to read at this level, you're gonna get a star, you're gonna be the lily group, or you're gonna be the duckling or something like that. And so, okay, so there you start off at six years old trying to meet somebody's standard in order to be approved. And that can continue on for the next seven or eight decades if you're not careful. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is trying to unplug from that right from the beginning and, and have that child start off with this, okay, I'm me. <laughs> and now I can build from that. I want, and we want to help them build out from that, but we have to start at that basis. So I'm going to give you, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to just kind of share with each other your experiences with this uh, dynamic. Is it unclear to anybody what I'm asking? Okay, Let's see what you can do. <laughs> Okay, was that fun? <laughs> Good. Does anybody have a highlight that they're just dying to share that they heard from somebody else? Yes. I think you write it down. There's so much in, you know, you take less 
for the students and how you want to get them and what you want to get them uh, and you know obviously raising your consciousness and going from there and it'll, it'll cool. happen. Yes. Lesson plans are great in terms of focusing in a certain direction, but then you do. You have to let loose and just see where the energy wants to flow. And if you're tied to your lesson plans, you miss all those special moments because you're not seeing your kids. So um, anything else people wanted to share with the whole group? Yeah. Just how important that connection is between teacher and students and how you carry that with you in your adult heart, whether it was a positive relationship or a negative one. So important. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you go back to the Greeks, you know, it seemed like that's the way the Greeks operated. Just on a very one-to-one -one basis, just to, you know, mentor and student, and things worked for them. <laughs> so it's, it's, the, it's the foundation. It's the foundation that we need to... Uh, cultivate and take the time. It does take time, uh, especially if you have, you know, well, it's one of the reasons we have fewer kids in our classes, because it does take time to bond with each child. But, um, you know, you, it's, it'll, if, you, if it's your intention, if that's your intention, and you hold that intention, it will happen. Those opportunities will come up. It might come up, the best ones come up spontaneously. You're just, you're all of a sudden, you're, you're just, oh my gosh, <laughs> and there's, there's this person, and you get, you get to connect with them in exchange. And then you know you go on from there, but if, uh, so that's the first thing. Now, the second topic this morning is basically refining the instrument of how we do that, because what gets in the way? What gets in the way of making those connections? Well, there are two things that I can think of. One is our minds. Our minds are whipping around at 100 miles an hour from thing to thing to thing to thing, and we don't see the kids. <laughs> we or another thing our mind does is that we start to get these ideas about who this kid is. Oh, that's a problem kid. <laughs> or that's, that's um, you know, somebody who's hard to get to know or something like that. And we have these mental uh, perceptions that start to block us and start to keep us from making those connections. So learning to get control of our mind is an important part of being an EFL teacher, not letting your mind control you but getting it so you can, you can recognize these things. You can see them, and then you have some tools for letting go of them. So you don't, you're not acting from those prejudices or, those, or that busyness. Second thing that gets in the way is our emotions, because we had a bad day. Somebody said something mean to us, and that throws us off for the rest of the day, <laughs> that we're just kind of a, we're just walking around the classroom like a zombie, we're, we're getting through, but it's, our emotions are churning and so much inside, we can't, we can't really relate to what's going on around us. So it would also be really good to get control of our feelings. Now, so that's a sm small challenge, right? <laughs> getting control of your mind and your feelings. <clears throat> it's a lifelong work. We all have to recognize that. But for an EFL teacher, you want to be working on this. You want to be working on developing this skill as part of your development as a teacher. So what does that bring us to? What's the, there's one activity that works on both of those things at the same time. <laughs> it's called, let's see the next, the next slide. <laughs> How to meditate. <clears throat> this is again, this is a, a big, it's a, it's a shift, it was a shift for me because I didn't learn to meditate particularly for those reasons. I learned to meditate for my spiritual path. But what I realized is it works equally as well for people who don't see themselves on a spiritual path, simply as a tool for learning to relate, to be a better teacher, to be able to relate to people. And if you practice meditation on a regular basis, you will start to develop more and more control over these two areas of our lives, more of control of the feelings, the emotions, and more control over the thoughts. So I have put together this, um, this handout, it basically lists all the things on there. There's just the steps to meditation, um, it's not from a devotional perspective, it's just from a get control of things. And then on the back is a little, I, if you've been around me very long, you know that there's always charts to go with whatever I say. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, there's a, a little chart, you can keep track of your progress and stuff like that. So these will be uh, on the table for free if anybody wants one.
But also, I wanted to just also have a little bit of a group discussion, but not in the small groups. Who can give a little uh, story about meditation helping them in terms of working with children? Okay, Chandi. Um, there was a teacher at our school who uh, came in to the school and she was having a really, really hard, difficult time. And I, had, I said to her, if you don't have a good morning sadhana, your classroom will be all disarray and it will get your goat. And um, sure enough, the intuitive ones always got to her first. The ones that were in tune with the higher principles or just vibration, they always got her goat. And, and so I've always remembered that. I don't know where it came from, but I, I always watch myself when I come into class, how good my meditation really was <laughs> that, that morning because it immediately shows up for me. Yes. I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but. Um, yeah. This is kind of unrelated teaching, but how I got into meditation was when I was working with kids, but also a nurse, um, for zero to two in the med surge unit. And I could only meditate three minutes a day. That's all I could do. I learned how to meditate, I was 25. And uh, I did it every, I did it a couple mornings and my day, to a school in a lot of ways. But, um, and the days that I didn't do that, only three minutes, then my day did not go well. And so that, I really built on that and would get up earlier and earlier and earlier so I could increase my meditation because it made such a tangible difference in everything I did. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I don't meditate with regularly, but um, one time I actually got up earlier because I'm not a morning person but I did um, get up earlier and meditated and when I got to school and I have this student who um, needs a lot of attention and sometimes he's very nice to me and he hugs me and there are other times where he acts up and you don't know what he needs and that morning <coughs> he was acting up he was telling um, you know words that not appropriate and <clears throat> I could just see what he needs what why he is doing that um, so it was just clearly just feeling that he just needs a hug and I just got uh, over to him I didn't pay attention to his words and what he was saying I just gave him a hug and he was like mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful right. I'm, I'm thinking not only just a meditation practice in the morning, but also bringing that attunement into throughout the day. And I was thinking back my first year teaching here, and I, I mean, I came from regular teacher training, you know, through college and all of that, and Nitai saying to me, don't do so many lesson plans from the beginning. No, Ronnie, you do too many lesson plans. You know, I think he would still say that to me. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I knew I was, I mean, I didn't know anything. I was even just learning to meditate. And so what I brought to the day was not the greatest. <laughs> and, and I knew I wasn't supposed to do what I was trained to do. <laughs> Throughout the day, I would just always say, Okay, God, tell me what to do. You know, inwardly, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And I would say what came through, and I think, wow, that was good. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that. You know, and again and again and again, just tell me what to do. 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 And so for me, it wasn't. I mean, because I was, like I said, I was just learning to meditate. But that bringing it moment to moment into the classroom was also really helpful. Those are really good stories because it doesn't take a lot of meditation to, to make a difference. You don't have to meditate three hours a day to, to make a difference in your classroom. You know, just the whole idea of just stopping and going inside makes a huge difference that way. Anybody else? Yeah.
Kayla and I get to be helpers in creating that shift. Mm -hmm. And they learn to appreciate yes. that, that centeredness. Yes. Say yes. Um, I, I used to, I, I had to talk to, to people to make a living when I was in Guatemala. Um, I was a musician, so I had to talk to people to, to connect. Um, so the days when I, when I, when I didn't, when I didn't meditate, the days when, uh, without meditation, those days I didn't make any money. <laughs> See, meditation can make you rich. <laughs> so, so meditation became became uh, a very important part because <laughs> it's, it's, it's the way to connect. Is is when you are centered, you know, people can feel it. Everybody can feel it. You have like a magnetic field that that, that is going to attract or is going to do the opposite. So I think the kids is the same, and um, one of my uncles always said, um, oh, you, you're very good with kids, you, you look like a cartoon or something, <laughs> they, they look for you. And, uh, but meditation is very important in every area for everything. There, there's because a term in the... We, we can have a bad day without meditation. <laughs> <laughs> there's a term in the yoga tradition, it's called darshan, and uh, it's a term that doesn't translate very well into uh, English, but it basically means presence, it means presence, and uh, just exactly what you're describing, maybe at a higher octave, but because people want to go to a saint to get their darshan. Um, I know we got to go see an underway ma once that way, and people were clamoring just to get around her, but they, if they had the subtle part of it, which not everybody did, but just to be able to appreciate that there was this presence exuding from her that was uplifting, and people wanted just to be in and feel that. Well, on a s smaller level, the same thing happens when we meditate, just exactly what you're describing. You know, we, you just, we create that aura. And the children, children amazingly, are more tuned into that. They have, they have fewer, less, less static than most adults. So they're, they're drawn more through their feelings and through their intellects, and they tune into that. So we give children a tremendous gift when we exude that presence and then they, they just naturally attune to it. So per thanks for bringing that up. Somebody else, yes? What meditation I noticed <coughs> helped me transform was my sense of time and the importance of like, so for example, I when I first started teaching and that was like when meditation was new to me, um, I was just seeing like every mistake or every hour, every minute, every day as like this thing that was like set in stone or I had to accomplish certain things or if it didn't go well, then I wanted to like fix it for the next day. But now it's sort of transformed, I think, as a product of meditation into thinking of longer patterns. So I think of like the whole week instead of a day. And so then I'm less likely to tune into mistakes of myself or the kids. It's like, if I remember once I was babysitting and the mom said, oh, don't worry, if they don't eat their green beans. They'll get them at some point during the week. So I heard <laughs> that happened, <laughs> that shit happened. Nice, nice. <laughs> so like it's so like us stepping back, you're not completely engrossed in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But in a tense way, you can see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Those are all great things. The, um, I didn't uh, comment on what Narani was saying, but the, the whole idea of drawing inspiration or being aware of inspiration as you're mentally more calm and emotionally more calm, because we are, there are subtler in, you know, things that are available to us in, in the moment, knowing what to say or what to do. And the calmer and the more centered we are, the more we're going to be able to tune into those things and activate that. If we're rushing around and we're all frantic, we're not going to be able to hear them. They're just going to bounce off and uh, go the other way. So there's lots of really good reasons. Uh, somebody once was teaching uh, about, um, about education for life. They said, they said that all, um, all AFL teachers need to be Creobonds. And I heard that. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> but... but Kriya is a special technique for those of you who don't, uh, aren't aware of it that is taught in this particular path. But then I thought the, that's not right, but the 
idea of meditating does, I do think that's an essential part of being a, an education for life teacher and cultivating it on some level that makes, uh, makes sense to the person. Let's be, so we incorporate that into the uh, teacher training programs now. Uh, you know, that's, this, that's what this, these charts were developed for, was basically the online courses and people, even if they haven't been exposed to meditation, which is getting to be smaller and smaller. I mean, meditation is growing, not beautifully now. It's nice, there's so many people around the world that meditate. Public schools have center, you know, mindfulness sessions in them and stuff, so it's, it's, it's coming on. People are starting to see the benefits of it more and more, so we're not nearly as much on the fringe as we used to be that way, so it's, um, it's nice to see the progress of the whole world. Okay, so um, you have, you know, for, for building this uh, edifice of education for life, we've got the foundation, we've got the idea of connecting unconditionally with these children, each, each child individually, um, and trying to make that part of what we do. We're working on refining ourselves. We, we, we're honest with ourselves. We're, none of us are perfect at any of, at either of those things, controlling our minds or controlling our, our emotions. But all we want to do is see is progress. <laughs> Just are we making progress? Are we moving along? Are we better this year than we were last year? And that's all it's asked. Um, so then you have this, where, this next question is, where are we trying to go? And again, this is something that differentiate, differentiates ed, education for life from a lot of other ideas out there which are more, yes, they're centered on the child, but they're centered on the child and say, well, let's let the child decide what they want to do. Let's let the, let the, the children, you know, the children should set the tone and where, we, where they want to go. Well, the problem with that is that children, there's just the way the world's set up. They don't have the wisdom that hopefully the teacher brings to the situation. Not always. <laughs> but education for life, yes, the teacher brings a certain level of wisdom about how does life work? What creates happiness? What creates sadness? And how can we start to direct, help the child work in those directions, take their energies from their starting point, but move it in a particular way? Um, there's a saying that you might have heard. It says, if, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So. <laughs> And I remember um, visiting, we went up to Seattle, I took the, our high school up to Seattle, and one of the main reasons was we were trying to look for, um, you know, I'm always looking for peers that they can relate to, so they know that they're not the only kids getting this kind of education, and there's other people out. So we read about this school that had this um, program of helping other people. It was some article I'd read, and I thought, oh, wow, let's go visit that school. It'd be nice, we can connect with these kids. So we went, and um, spent the morning there, and it was so disappointing <laughs> because I never didn't see anybody helping anybody. And I finally said, "What about this program you had written up about you helping?" Oh yeah, well, that was something we did. We did about six months ago. We think we had a unit on that. Yeah, <laughs> and and what was happening? It was an open school. Uh, they honored the child. That was one of the things they promoted. They honored the child of you know, in a way. Well, what were the children doing? Um, well. One group was sitting around watching uh, old uh, episodes of Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Another group was sitting around practicing makeup skills, how to, how to put on your lipstick and your eyeshadow and stuff. Uh, third group was playing um, board games. And yes, they were getting to do what they did, what they wanted to do, but the vibration the whole place was kind of, huh. You know, everybody was just kind of, slumped over and there was no dynamism, there was no enthusiasm because there was no wisdom being practiced and there was no leading. There was no leading happening from the staff. The staff was simply there to watch the kids and see what they wanted to do and then let them, help them to do it. And it's a, it's a stepping, it's a, you know, it's certainly a, a stepping stone towards where we want to go with education, but it's, it desperately needs this other element of wisdom and where are we trying to go? So that's what I want to spend the next period uh, talking about. Um, so I thought I was going to see this book. So I'm not going to talk about this book too much. Everybody who knows this book goes, ah, no, <laughs> we're not going to spend the rest of the morning on this. <laughs> it's a very difficult book to read. Deepika, do you want to give a testimonial? <laughs> uh, yes, OK. And I, we, this is part of the teacher development program now. Uh, we, we go through it 
as part of the uh, Experiencing Education for Life class. But the reason I bring it up here today is this is the founding stone for this, because without what happens in this out of the labyrinth, we're liable uh, to people to come up to us and say, well, why are you doing that? What do you th what's, makes you think kindness is a good thing to, to teach? Why should you teach uh, courage? Why should you teach um, even mindedness? I mean, look at our politicians. <laughs> they seem to get by pretty well without any of those qualities. <laughs> uh, but, um, it, and then say, well, you know, what do you, and you say, well, blah, 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 blah. well, uh, Yogananda said it was a good idea, <laughs> you know, which isn't any different than somebody saying, well, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, and therefore, we, that's how we do it. Why we do it? It's blind faith. Um, if you take the time to read this book and go through it, you see it's not blind faith at all. He so it took, so it took J. Donald Walter, Swami Kriyananda, it took him 10 years to write this book, which is phenomenal when you look at later in life, he was writing books in a month or two weeks, you know, even. But this book, the reason it took 10 years is he had to go back through and re-examine the basis of Western culture <laughs> and really try to understand it in a way that harmonizes what he knew was true from the teachings from the East, but show in the way, in the language and the experiences, the insights of the West, why this, these same things were true. He takes Darwin, he takes the you know, philosophers like um, Kant and people like that, uh, just all the, the biologists, and just goes through step by step and shows, if you really look at these things, there is an underlying truth that they're showing. Most of the scientists might not have seen it when they were looking because they had their blinders on of their materialistic uh, bias. But if you open up, so it's a fabulous book. It's well worth the time it takes to go through it. Because, especially if you're in a position of being a director because you're the one that's going to get the questions from these people. Say, well, what are you, what are you doing that? <laughs> so you can, you can take them through it. But we're not going to go into that today, but I'm just saying that's there. That's where the foundation can be looked at. This, for me, is, is the, you know, the uh, place where I started. Um, when, I, when the school first started, there was no book education for life, and um, I wasn't sure what it meant to have this kind of a school. So um, Swami Kriyananda said, well, you can look, you can have access to my library, and if anything you can find in there, uh, you'll, you'll find things that will be useful. So I, this is one of the two things I found. The other one is The Balanced Life, which I talk about a lot, but I won't do so much tonight, today. So the psychological chart, thanks to Anandi, it's in a nice uh, format now. It's a list of qualities, and the qualities go from one end of a spectrum to the other. You know, for we know the words, we have a term for it now called progressive development. But it goes basically from a very self-centered, low energy level that can be called Tom Tomasic here, Tomas, or heavy, or another word that sometimes gets used is morally handicapped. <laughs> but it's just behavior that is just at the bottom of the ladder in terms of human behavior. And then it maps it all the way up to the top. Here he is, you know, from the Indian perspective, he used the word sattva, but we could use the word light or expansive. Um, and it just lists these different words, such as, I can read any of them. <laughs> this one will, some people are going to go, <gasps> procrastinatory. <laughs> it's one that, when you see some of these things like shy is down here somewhere in the building. Anyway, um, and going up through things here, arrogant, disrespectful, impulsive, sense, sense, uh, sharp but shy, jolly, and then up here to uh, tender, reserved, all the ones that we know we want to cultivate. And it kind of map, it makes a map. It's a map, basically. It just tells you, here's, here's how it goes. But it's kind of a very general map. And I, I would look at this thing year after year. And, okay, what, what can I do with this? I, I can see it. I can label some things. What do I do with it? So the next step was to <clears throat> this was a, a chart that I put together when I got the term progressive development. And I took a lot of these qualities from the psychological chart and just tried to put them in order, again, going from heavy to light, but trying to categorize them in terms of truthfulness or uh, let's see, reaction when corrected, response to great people, 
specific kinds of behavior and how what does a consciousness manifest in that situation depending on where somebody's at. So let's, let's get to take you through one of, one of these. These will also be available. Anybody that doesn't have one. So let's say truthfulness. So truthfulness is a challenge in life. You know, are you, can you be truthful or not? Well, at the low end of the spectrum, people are evasive. They say whatever is convenient. So that's how truthfulness manifests at that heavy level. If you go up the ladder a little bit to ego, ego active heavy, it becomes manipulative, a little more energy. <laughs> They're trying to get something for themselves. Willing to lie to get one's way. Okay, well, that's their, re their response to truthfulness. That they just, they use it for their own, they twist it to their own needs, okay? We certainly see that, again, in the world news all the time. Um, then you go up the next level, ego active light, truthful because of others' expectations. So if you're truthful, but kind of because of your surroundings, or, you know, and if you're kind of, you can't always count on yourself, you might slip down, but if you're in the right situation, you'll probably be truthful because you kind of believe in it, but you just can't follow through all the time. You're just kind of still working on it. And at the top of the ladder, it's spontaneous truthfulness regardless of consequences, which again, fortunately, we can see in world events. We see people who do stand up for truth no matter what and uh, can use that as an inspiration for ourselves. So this was a really important step because it took the psychological chart and it put it in a little format where I, you know, to see these specific qualities evolving as consciousness evolves. So when I'm working with children, I can see, oh, okay, well, they're, that's where they are at. They're, they're being evasive. And when I ask them questions, let's see if I can't help them move up the ladder a little bit. Um, you know, pardon? To manipulate, yeah. Yeah, to move them, <laughs> can I get them up to manipulative from, and, and actually but see, that as a, see that as growth. That, that's one of the hardest things because when you, this ego active heavy level is the hardest one to work at because not only are they kind of heavy, but they have energy. <laughs> and so that they make things difficult for everybody. But anyway, to see that that's, you'd rather have energy, no matter, no matter what's happening, you'd rather have energy than no energy, you know, even if the energy is being abused. And that's a really difficult lesson for a teacher to, to learn because sometimes you just, oh my God, at least they're quiet. <laughs> at least they're <laughs> So anyway, energy is important. So this was a, a good help. Um, but then came along the next, the next part. <clears throat> that was tools of maturity. And that was an incredible, powerful tool that, uh, you know, again, I didn't have in the beginning. Uh, but when Swami articulated that, you know, the, the, this is where the, it, he took the, what, the, what I had found in the balanced life, that was the other article, and just made it more accessible. We have these, as you all know, body, feeling, will, and intellect. And so we could also take some of those qualities, though, and start to put them, uh, categorize them in this way, which, again, helps because you can, like you're trying, okay, well, I really, this child really needs to work on body or feeling or will, and well, what does that really mean? <laughs> I'm just trying to get specific. Every time I've done this chart, it's gone through many, many versions. I've always left a blank at the end of each level. And the reason for the blank is these are not the only ways to talk about this particular tool. And if you come up with another one, or if a child comes up with another, say I'm sitting down with a child and we're talking about balance and we come to the, the mutual uh, agreement that willpower is really important and we need to work on willpower. And so we're looking for what are we gonna do? Well, we can go through the ones that are listed here, but maybe they have their own idea. <laughs> And I always want to be open to that and say, okay, yeah, that fits. Let's just do that. So again, this is not meant to be the Ten Commandments. It's just meant to be a lot of uh, examples that we can work with in these different uh, tools when we're working with the kids. <clears throat> so now we get to the next part, which was the life skills, which was, again, only, that was two years ago, coming, those coming out. Because it was, I would sit down and I would have these conferences using the tools of maturity with my students and we'd talk about what they need to work on. And I would try to come up with practical things to do, but in the spur of the you know, moment, sometimes you can't remember things. You can't say, how do you work on, on, on willpower? And you know, I just always wanted, I, wished, I want to have something like a toolkit that's right there that I can pull on 
and I'll help jar my memory you know, about you know, where we can go from in this area. So that's where the, uh, the uh, life skill cards came from. We have 15 life skill cards. Most of you have seen them. Again, it's just a start. <laughs> I wish I had life skills for 100 different things, but I, you know, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe some of you will help develop them. Um, we, we have the ones for diet, getting up in the morning, healthy habits, making friends, choosing happiness, etc. cetera. Um, but you might easily come up with something that's not in this list. And the idea is, okay, we'll do, just to use the formula, just to take the, whatever the quality is you're trying to work on, can you come up with five or six different activities that a child could do to make progress in that? Or can they come up with five or six activities? It's even better. The more ownership you get, obviously, the better, the more the motivation is, is higher. So um, trying to make use of these, this, is, this particular one is just a, uh, I use it to present this, this, this different skills to children. It lists all the skills. It asks for their interest level. How, are, how interested in you in this quality, in this particular quality, on a scale of 1 to 10? And then how willing are you to work on it on a scale from 1 to 10? Again, trying to get their participation. I don't want to, I want to go, don't want to go, I mean, you could slip back into the old way. You need to work on exploring th flexibility. All right, now, let's sit down and do it. <laughs> you know, it's, we just lost all the foundation work. But it, to sit down and we talk about what's going on, you know, well, hmm, I keep getting upset with, uh, you know, with so-and-so or something. Well, you know, flexibility is a really good skill to have. What do you think about working on flexibility? Yeah, that would probably help me not have to get upset so much. So. How are we going to work on flexibility? Well, let's, let's look at the card. And let's, let's look at some of these ideas. Do you, do you want to do this one, or A, B, C? Yes. Well, as you're talking, I have this question, and I'll lose it if I don't say yes. it now. Um, so because this is all new, last year you know, we had one set of cards for the whole school. So this year, we all have our own set. So it used to be, last year, I just pull one out that I thought would be appropriate for us all to work on, right, the whole class. So I got six, seven, and eight. So this year, I thought I, since I have my own set now, <laughs> I was wondering if it would work for me to step out of it and let the kids choose a card that they think, are they wise enough to be able to, or are they going to pick the easy ones or the fun ones, or will they really pick ones that they really feel like they could work on? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when I was trying them out up here with the junior high and senior high, I found that the older the kids were, the more mature they were, the more they wanted to work on one themselves. They wanted to choose one, and they, they, wanted, they were mo motivated enough to make it happen. As we got down into the 7th seventh and 8th graders, more of a group thing seemed to work better. Like They, like they might have subgroups, like, like, small groups. like small groups within the class. Like, okay, these, this group wants to work on courage, this group wants to, you know. And, and I didn't worry so much about the easy, uh, hard ones, because I thought, if somebody needs to work on an easy one to build up their confidence, that's okay, that's okay, just as long as they're starting to get to feel it. And that was the really powerful thing that I, I didn't know ahead of time, but that from working with the kids here, how, what's the word, how rewarding it was to them to feel empowered that they could actually change their behavior. And I, I just, I mean, it's obvious when you think about it, but I didn't realize that that would be a motivator for the kids to start to work on it, that, just, I remember this, this one boy I was working with, he has, had a really hard time expressing himself to the point where I was working with him one-to-one -one on these cards and I would ask him a question. I have to wait two and a half minutes sometimes to get a response. And the, te the temptation to jump in and answer for him was so strong. <laughs> but I, okay, <sighs> and let's just sit. And then two and a half minutes went by and boop, <laughs> out came a little answer. And but then he started to pick up on the fact that he could change. He could change any behavior he wanted to. And it was really exciting to see that. And just, uh, so anyway, yeah, so that's the way to go. Okay, so we have these cards. They're available. And, um, and just, they again, just uh, integrate them whatever way makes sense to you. So this is a... <clears throat> Basically, what we've got then, we've got a platform, a foundation of our connection with the student, and we have a direction that we're trying to help them explore and evolve in. And those two together are incredibly powerful, and they just, um, they'll, they'll, 
make a huge help, a huge help to people who can have that kind of training. Where they go with it, we don't really have to care about it. You know, it's like, what are they, what are they gonna do with this? Are they gonna go out and, uh, you know, build airplanes? Or are they gonna go out and uh, dance? Are they gonna go out and whatever? It's just, uh, but how they do it is gonna be affected by the training they got, how they're gonna approach it no matter what they're doing. And you, you see this, for those of you who have been around some of the alumni, you see this and it's so exciting. You, you see them popping up in Education for Life classrooms. <laughs> and, but just, uh, it's just, all we're doing is we're training them for life. And their life, their karma is their own. Um, one of the, the fun metaphors that came to me at one point is when you're an EFL teacher, it's like you're a farmer and they, somebody sent you a, a big box of seeds. But the problem was that they'd taken the wrappers off all the things, and they just dumped all the seeds together. So you don't know what seed you've got, <laughs> but your job as the farmer is not to worry about what's the seed. Your job is to cultivate it and help it to blossom and become, and it's surprising for you to see. And I just, it, over and over again, I had one of my former students uh, last week come up to me and just said, Nitai, can we just sit down and just talk a little bit? So I'd just, I'd just like to kind of renew our friendship. This is somebody who I'd have to ask to leave the school <laughs> at one point because it was so difficult. <laughs> And, and he just, and he basically wanted to say he was sorry. <laughs> and sorry for being an adolescent that had been, you know, completely off the wall. But he's, he's doing beautifully now. He's doing beautifully with his life. And it just, he's got these tools and he was learning them. He was learning them in a, his own way at that time. And it wasn't a whole lot of fun to work with him. But here he is, you know, blossoming. And so you just say, okay, the process works. The process can be a powerful one. So. That's our, our joy. It's our joy to, as an EFL teacher, is just to be able to do this groundwork to uh, help people. Any comments or thoughts? Yes. Exactly, exactly. It's like, how can you take that self that you've acknowledged and help it to expand? And help them to realize that expansion is rewarding to them. When they're expanding, they're going to feel better. And that's a, I could say it in one sentence, it's something that I've been so impressed with because I've seen four-year-olds understand this, not, I mean, understand is not the right word, be able to cognize this, this, that, the difference between expansion and contraction. And it's something that's just built into human nature. And that's, again, that goes back to out of the labyrinth. That's, that's the basic part of what uh, was presented in that book is that this urge for expansion Expansion of awareness is inherent in every atom of creation. And so it's there with our, stu our students and we can help them by giving them a little mirroring. We can help them to recognize that when they do expand, they just feel better. And who doesn't want to feel better? <laughs> and when they contract, they feel worse. So, but, but it's from that core, that core themselves, and they're gonna expand in unique ways which we have to be ready for as teachers, so yes. Probably your gardens are a little ragged around the edges. <laughs> yeah, right. An EFL classroom is a little ragged around the edges usually because <laughs> it's not. <laughs>
you, you find equal things wrong and you try to correct that. So if you have a bug, you get a chemical for that bug. Mm -hmm. If you have this weed, you get a chemical to kill that weed. And pretty soon you kill the system. Whereas in education for life, it's a holistic system. You want a healthy, if you create a healthy system, it will grow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we're going to take a little break. Uh, I'd like to, I'm going to say 10 minutes because I'd really like to start in 15 minutes. So, <laughs> bathroom break, stretch, whatever you'd like to, and we'll come back. But again, sit in the same place and with your groups because we're going to go back to a group uh, focus. Yeah. So, the next part of this uh, morning is looking at curriculum. And again, uh, Education for Life has a special angle on it. Um, most curriculum is developed um, with other things in mind besides the child. There are certain social um, priorities that uh, legislatures, legislators decide on. There are certain uh, curriculum things that are developed by uh, the people in Sacramento and California or in the other uh, capital situations are saying, children need to learn this. <laughs> and so we have these huge, extremely detailed curriculum maps that are out there that just basically drive everybody nuts. And um, that is, you know, again, the intention is good. The intention is to try to provide a rounded education. The implementation is horrible. Um, and so Education for Life is again trying to start from a different perspective. It's not trying to start from an external, externally developed curriculum. It's trying to start from the child. So just building on the, what we talked about this morning. So um, in the book, Education for Life, everybody knows it's the last chapter or second to the last chapter, which is interesting. You know, why is the curriculum at the end of the book? You know, Pretty much anybody else you talk about education, the curriculum is at the beginning of the book. <laughs> That's the first thing you talk about. What do you do? What do you do in your school? Now, how many people have been asked that question, right? Um, so we're saying it's what is the wrong question? <laughs> how, maybe, but more important, who? <laughs> who is in your classroom is the place you should start with, and then everything can grow from that. But if you start from the other way, you never get to who. You're always stuck. Well, the who doesn't fit into the what, so the who should go someplace else. <laughs> so... Um, what was that? Horton hears a who? <laughs> Maybe he was being intuitive about <laughs> EFL teaching. <laughs> um, okay. So something that came, I, I, I don't like to use the word inspired uh, specifically, but I really did feel this was inspired. Irene and I were sitting there one day at the desk trying to figure out how to map out the curriculum categories and we, were, we had this star we were trying to work with. We've been trying to work with the star for quite a while, and it start never quite fit. We couldn't figure out what to do with wholeness, and just was just wholeness around the circle, was in the middle, what was it, you know. And then she said something that just triggers. She said, you know, Swami talked about how he hoped that education for life would make use of the joy is within you symbol. And I said, he did? <laughs> I'd never heard of that. And, but it just kind of triggered something. And then the next thing in my brain was this, thing, this idea of using, if you know the joy is within you, then you have these big sweeping arcs that come back and they focus back in. And so this is what came out of it, which is, if you think of the wholeness, that's, that's, the, that's the soul. That's the essence of the child. That's the self that we're trying to cultivate. That's that thing we tried to spend the morning talking about, how we relate to that core. And everything that we do in the curriculum is simply expanding on that self, but also bringing it back to that focus so that the child is aware that he is being, he or she is being expanded. That's the expansion that's happening. So if we take understanding people, we go out here and we, we explore history, we explore current events, whatever, but we always bring it back to the child's reality. How does, now, um, later this morning, Matthew's going to talk about some things he did, which are perfect models for this, talking about studying, he'll tell you, I'm not going to take your, your talk, but the idea of the Cold War and how the Cold War tied into the child's realities, which will be fascinating to hear. 
But uh, you can do that with anything. You can do that with, you know, again, we use the word our Earth, our universe. I mean, the hour is this core that's that we're trying to come back. We don't want to just study astronomy for astronomy's sake. We want to, why does astronomy, how, how does it re re reflect or expand on the child's world? The child being, helping them to experience a broader, a broader um, vision of the world, but tied to their own reality. It's not how I was taught science. I, I just memorized fact after fact, equation after equation, you know, all these different things. And there's all this stuff sticking out here like on a big bulletin board that had no relationship to me, except that I would memorize them for tests and then usually forget about it afterward. But to study about, you know, how, you know, to have a relation, to have a relation with the, the planets or the, whatever you're studying, the earth, um, and then how it has an, an impact on my life, you'd have a better chance of remembering it, incorporating. You're, you're basically incorporating this knowledge as in your own sense of self as you go through this. So that's where this visual aid came, came from, just to help to remind us that that's always what we're trying to do. We're always trying to cycle back to the child's experience of themselves and how they're going to grow from that. So the next step was the curriculum generator, which yeah, I can read that, good. Um, and this was to take, because again, I had those qualities for a long time, and it was, I have to admit, it was hard to work with them. I could, I, like, how do I work with this? But here, I, the, the big thing here was these key questions. To, so to, to be able to incorporate these uh, categories into what I wanted to do with the children. So the main thing is up here at the top, write down your core topic. What is your theme? Now, how you get to that theme is again, uh, uh, Matthew and others will talk about that. Uh, how do you know what your class is ready to learn? How do you know what they're not, not just intellectually ready, but emotionally ready, all the different levels? What is it that they're asking for by, through their behavior, through their comments? You're, you're listening carefully. You're seeing, oh, this class is ready, needs this kind of a lesson. They need a lesson in, I mean, some of the obvious ones, uh, sensitivity to other people. <laughs> uh, courage might be one. Um, could be, but you'll, you'll just get, you'll get each class, you all know that, each class has its ups and flows. You have to feel a certain energy in the class and you want to respond to that energy and you create your curriculum to match that, whatever is manifesting in front of you. So after you get to this core topic, we're gonna, today we're gonna exercise, I'm gonna use the life skills as the core, as a, as a theme, just to give you ex experience of working with that. But again, it could be anything up in that level. Um, even to the point where I, maybe in Washington you have to do that. Do Washington, did you have to take a test at the end of the year to match the public school system? No, okay. In Europe they do. They have to take a test at the end of the year that matches the curriculum. So they have to spend, what they've discovered though is kind of interesting. They can spend basically April and May pretending they're a public school and learn all this stuff and pass the test. And then they get to go September to, to March, they can do just a more free form thing. But, so you could have up here you know, whatever the curriculum mandate that you have to meet if you're in that situation. And, but then you can still humanize it by going through these steps. So the first question for personal development is, how can your topic be used to provide motivation for your student's personal growth? So whatever you're studying, how can it, how can it help your child to grow? And so in what ways could they grow? What little next steps could they take in their own behavior? So, no matter what we're studying, we're going to ask that question and see if we can tune in to what could happen with the classroom. Understanding people. <clears throat> How does your topic affect the broad sweep of human events as well as the lives of individuals? So you're studying rocks. <laughs> you're going to still ask this question. How do rocks affect the broad sweep of human events and as well as the lives of individuals? Well, you know, you start to play with that. You say, well, let's see, rocks. Diamonds are rocks. How do diamonds affect people? Or rocks are geology, and they have to do with earthquakes. <laughs> How do earthquakes affect people's lives? And it's just always bringing it back to something that you can tie in more specifically to the child's world. <clears throat> Cooperation. What group activities incorporate your topic to advance global and or personal growth? What can you come up with that's going to get them to work together in this theme so that they're actually learning how to, how to use those interpersonal skills 
in a project that fits your classroom. <clears throat> Self-expression and communication. How can your topic be a source of inspiration for your students' writing and other forms of artistic expression? So let's take this theme of rocks. <laughs> what can, let's do a dance that has to do with rocks. <laughs> and you could do a whole thing of rocks melting in a volcano and then spewing out into the, you know, and anyway, just, you could do anything. But the idea is just, okay, what do we, how are we gonna, again, again, self-expression, not just any expression, but something that they've experienced. How can they, how can they express that in this lesson that you're developing? So, it's, so they have a sense of ownership. They have a sense of ownership. It's not just learning somebody else's um, forms. It's that they're developing their own. <clears throat> our Earth, our universe, how does your topic manifest in nature and in human interactions with nature? So this whole other dimension of life the uh, physical level, the material level. And then wholeness. How does your topic relate to the search for true, lasting happiness and ultimate fulfillment? And specifically the arts, literature, philosophy, religion. So, you can, so the whole idea is you can take any topic, any topic, and you can run it through these questions and you can come up with a whole bunch of fun things to do and a variety of things to do. So you're reaching everybody in the class, not just the particular ones who might uh, be naturally in tune with it. So what we're gonna do is that the, everybody got, each group got a laptop, and on your laptop, if it all well goes well, you open it up, and there's an example of this chart here, and you've got a, you know, a topic at the top, and you're gonna work as a group to just brainstorm activities to go in each of these categories. And See what you come up with. So we're going to take about half an hour for this. So you got plenty of time. And uh, if your computer doesn't work, talk to Brian. <laughs> so we only have three done because we had to start over. <laughs> um, and, but we decided on our, our core topic was working with others. So we decided on playing a game or a sport. And for personal development, what they would be gaining with sportsmanship skills um, and sort of as an addendum to that, after the activity was completed, the students would reflect on what they had gained and then using that information and experience, the students set personal goals for the future. Um, and then understanding people for the same thing, playing a game or a sport, um, what they would be getting would be including others with an awareness of differing abilities and differing goals. Because she was talking about in her school, the kids playing basketball, and first only the skilled ones wanting to play, and then include them learning to include others, and finally even including the younger children, which meant the game was not as high a level, but they really gained oh, understanding people. And then cooperation, um, learning to value the part that each person has to play, and establishing the parameters of the game that all can agree on. And that's as far as we can. Sorry. Good. Okay, I'll go over here. You guys, you don't have to tell, no, wait. tell me anything you want to about the process. Um, yeah, Peter, can you flip it over to the chair? Okay. Yes. Working with others. Whoever it goes to is going to speak. I had to type in. Okay, we did it a little bit differently. Can you? Okay, we did it a little differently where uh, we listed just different activities with each uh, section that could, that fall under those um, topics. So personal development, topic, uh, sorry, cultivating courage. And so under personal development, we said maybe kids could look at how does courage look on the playground? How do we join in a game that other kids are playing? Um, how another thing we could do is helping shy kids speak up in class. And under understanding people, we 
we thought that it would benefit kids to study people who are courageous. Amelia Earhart, um, Martin Luther King Jr., Malayla. Um, also, under cooperation, we thought the trust fall activity would be a good way to uh, develop courage and, and trusting your peers. And let's see. Oh, under Our Earth, Our Universe, um, Ashley mentioned that our camping trips and Heather mentioned our field trips are very um, good opportunities for kids to face things that they might be scared of. And it might be bugs, it might be animals, it might be weather, um, who knows. Um, so that's being away from home. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, under Wholeness, um, an idea we had was a closing circle time to reflect on uh, the children can share a moment when they saw someone being courageous or when they themselves had a moment of courage. And anything else you want to add? That's some of our ideas. Okay, we did a, a Living Truth. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically we looked at it f when we talked about understanding people, cooperation, etc. We had a few different topics. It was um, religions and cultures, so looking at different religions and how they talk about the truth in different cultures. And then looking at times when faith communities, particularly now, are actually working together for cooperation as an example of how we can look at cooperation and what the outcomes of that cooperation has been. Um, with our, our Earth, our universe, we talked about the impact that we're making on the planet right now and talking about making good choices and how do we make good choices and why it's easy to make good choices or not make good choices and how do we decide what they are um, and also looking at like people that deny what we're doing to the earth and sort of going is that being truthful and if not what do we do about that um, and then for wholeness all of that kind of incorporated it to some extent but we added why can it be so difficult to tell the truth um, how do you feel when you lie and is it a good feeling or a bad feeling and if you wanted to feel good is it something you'd want to continue doing or not um, and we brought in destroying the earth we brought in religion so we kind of use those as our overarching sort of things My computer went blank. Okay. So it's, we also just gave different examples of things. Um, the um, the theme is expanding sensitivity, but we also, instead of taking one activity and pulling it through all the different curriculum categories, we listed activities but I could we could all we kept coming back to how each one could be in any of the categories if you just came to it from a slightly different angle um, so personal development um, classroom jobs and responsibilities and how what you do affects or what other people do affect your job or your life um, caring for pets in the classroom um, playing or working with a new friend, understanding people, um, studying people in the community that have helped others. Parents or grandparents could come in and tell stories about school or their lives growing up or show pictures. And then um, you mentioned the smile poem, which was okay. Cooperation. Um, nature game, camera, singing together, uh, listening to each other while singing, like, um, you know, getting everybody on the same pitch or trying to or trying to hear what that sounds like or going to hear. Okay, so math, using your body in different groupings as a number. Um, we were talking about that, or that could be in self-expression and communication too. I mean, they all can go in any one. Uh, Self-expression and communication, teaching your stuffy a math concept, and in interviewing a friend, and then tell, draw, or write about that friend's life. Um, looking for 
patterns in nature and sharing th that through drawing, telling or writing, working with a partner um, with pattern blocks or looking for patterns in numbers in math. Um, our Earth, our universe, visiting and observing nature at a nearby pond, engaging and sharing in nature activities, growing and then releasing an animal like a pollywog or butterfly to nature. And wholeness, meditation times, sharing after any of the aforementioned things, <laughs> um, breathing together back to back where you tune in to each other's breath and maybe breathe at the same time or off and on in patterns. Um, partner yoga, recognizing the difference in people's abilities and accommodating and reading and listening to poetry, interpreting it and discussing. That's me, right? Okay. okay. Um, our topic was building willpower. Um, the basic premise around that was that we were going to start with personal development and let students study individuals of their choice who achieved success through willpower, right? Um, and our, the example that we ended up using for this was Lincoln as we continued through. Um, but each student would study someone individually that they were drawn to and then present their individuals to the group. And then as a group, they would be asked to choose just one individual that they all connected with to proceed with the project. So maybe that's Lincoln is the topic, the person they end up with. Uh, moving forward with that, we ask the kids to produce a play based on the life of this person. And there are a lot of components to it and a lot of other little pieces that go with it that are facets of it. Um, under understanding people, we particularly want our students to look at, in this case, Lincoln's family values, um, the, the things in his personal life that influenced the choices he made. Where did his willpower come from? How did that relate to his past and the things that he loved in his present? Um, under cooperation, everything is sort of cooperation in this project because they're going to work together to produce a play, but they would also be asked to put a song a yoga performance or a dance of some kind that they're doing all in unison in the play together. So they will have to both um, choreograph that and accomplish that. Um, we also talked about having a PE activity or dramatic play reenacting one of the battles from Lincoln's history. Um, for self-expression and communication, um, we talked about studying or memorizing one of Lincoln's speeches, like the Emancipation Procl Proclamation or um, the Second Inaugural Address, um, and to memorize that and present it. There's also the possibility that they could write a speech themselves about something that they want to change in the world. It could be something small in their own classroom or lives, or it could be something much bigger looking outside, depending on how old they are. Um, for our Earth, our universe, one moment, let me scroll. All right, for our Earth, our universe, um, we want to look at how Lincoln's decisions changed the world, or whoever, whatever individual we choose. So we're going to give them a creative writing topic. What would today look like if this person hadn't lived? How would your world be different? Um, and also under our Earth, our universe, a math topic. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation starts out four score and seven years ago. What does that even mean? How do we do that math, and, and how has our language around math changed? Um, and under wholeness, we'd like to study Lincoln's portraits and discuss, discuss his qualities and what qualities we see in those portraits, whether they're visible or hidden, and ask our students to produce their own self-portraits. Depending on their age levels or abilities, this might be something in pastel or pencil, but it also might be something like collage. It might not be a physical representation of their body, but rather the things that they're passionate about or that they want to affect change in. Um, we would like our students to, um, oh, this one was an interesting one. We were talking about having our students write a treaty in class. The idea that we discussed is that um, willpower is not something that exists in a vacuum. Everybody has their own willpower. And when you meet someone who has equal willpower as you, how do you navigate that? And in this example, we talked about Lincoln 
yes, we look back at Lincoln as a wonderful historical figure, well-loved, but he was at the center of a war. Half a country hated Lincoln. How did he navigate that? Um, so we ask our students to examine that in writing. Um, and last, a final writing prompt. What is one time you've exercised willpower with success, and how did it make you feel? Sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no problem. Okay, so ours was, our topic was practicing peace. So, uh, again, for us too, there was a lot of overlap in all the categories. But for personal development, we have things like meditation as a way to work with stress while uh, trying to achieve your goals, uh, pranayama and breath control, energization, yoga postures, depending on the age group you're working with. Uh, understanding people, sending healing prayers, studying individuals who exemplify peace, uh, you know, the Martin Luther Kings or the um, uh, Nelson Mandela or Gandhi, uh, and how your own peace and others' peace affects the environment around them. Uh, cooperation, nonviolent communication, learning how to resolve differences peacefully, and acting out skits or role play, playing in this case, maybe. Uh, this was an interesting one, Ro uh, role playing historical events that ended badly and <laughs> acting it out uh, as if it was resolved peacefully uh, and what, what might be the ramifications of that. Um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, Self-expression and communication, uh, we thought poetry or a group poem or a group art project, you know, that ties right back into cooperation, of course. Uh, stories or plays that show conflict resolution in history and the performance. Uh, vision boarding full of peaceful images. Um, sorry, okay. Uh, our Earth, our universe, connecting with nature to experience peace of nature within you. Learning about permaculture farming, just because that was such an appropriate uh, example, appropriate metaphor. Sending energy to plants with thoughts and music and see how they are affected by positive and negative energy. So we talked about uh, Dr. Emoto and we talked about the Luther Burbanks and the George Washington Carvers who tuned into nature on a, on a more profound level. And they were able to actually communicate with um, natural forces. So, oh, I lost my place here. Uh, oh, yes, ta uh, animal taming and how your own peace or lack of that affects animals, serving a greater environmental cause. This is all under our Earth, our universe. Uh, and asking children what's one way they can live more sustainably to support our environment. Uh, and then under wholeness, we have the study of great saints, serving others, service projects that create peace. Uh, we also talked a little bit about literature how that fits there and, uh, you know, maybe a story of some of those uh, people mentioned. Uh, yeah, so, practicing peace. Yeah. So we had uh, choosing happiness and uh, for personal development, we said working with peer relationships and families, things like learning to compromise and also using affirmations, singing uplifting songs, meditation, journaling, reflection, and something like a peace corner or a space or how spaces can help give um, students opportunities to realize that they can uh, take time away from a situation to reorient, reorient, reorient. Understanding people, we talked a lot about um, drama and setting, uh, acting out the lives of, of great saints and people in history. Um, for cooperation, Reader's Theater, uh, Valentine's Day are using holidays that promote sharing and the importance of community. Uh, things like partner reading, Big Brothers, all school plays as well, and then field trips and adventure trips, and uh, PE for cooperation. Uh, Self-expression and communication, using uplifting colors and art, 
uh, pen pals with students in other countries, fundraisers for social activism, field trip reflection, metacognition through like journaling, writing, um, also public speaking, prayer flags, um, and things that give students choice. Uh, for our earth, our universe, poetry and figures of speech around nature, power of the metaphor, uh, sharing nature activities, science fair, field trips and uh, around science or um, field work, scientific field work, rite of passage such as like vision quests, vision quests, but in general camping, backpacking and outdoor um, classrooms and also gardens and uh, butterfly hatchings and anything involving pets or animals in the classroom. Um, And for wholeness, connecting with others and ourselves, especially um, the power of like circle time or just getting in a circle and having satsang with students, even though you might not call it satsang. Uh, the language of emotions and happiness so that we know where we're going. And in general, uh, interpersonal communication, again, around circle time or, or opportunities to really share and be present with each other, learning to share oneself with others and learning to be authentic. Uh, also yoga and meditation, and for wholeness, also uh, health and hygiene and how meeting our basic needs, healthy use of technology, awareness around technology, sleep, and uh, sensitivity to refinement and beauty, or in general, beauty, appreciation, and fun. Yes. It seems like some people interpreted it um, in a way where you know, they're thinking of lots of different activities that were kind of connected, um, but a lot of them interconnected, not necessarily connected to one another. And other groups decided that they were to take a theme and carry that through. And I wonder, um, I mean, I've got, I know there's not a right or a wrong way to do that, but I just wondered if it's more meaningful to the child to have it be more thematic like that because then there's these connections, these touch points all along the way throughout the year. And I, like, I know I was talking to Colin briefly about you know, they're going to set up this, this idea of Lincoln throughout their year. And so then everything revolves around that and we get all the points around mm -hmm. Lincoln like um, Terrellin Ter uh, expressed. And, that, that seems like a really neat way to go because you know, there's always those connections yeah. that they can make. They're both, they're both valid. Like the um, one is, you know, you're taking, you're showing breadth. You're just showing this relates this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. You know, it's all like a big spider web. And the other one is depth, where you're showing this, you can learn this quality from this experience and you can learn a little deeper over here. You can learn, you just keep going deeper and deeper. So either way, it's, you know, the teacher has to decide what, what's appropriate at that time yeah yeah so um hope you enjoyed that so now we're going to have a couple of three uh, presentations of people who actually worked on specific things and first this i was going to ask the seattle group to come up because they they were the guinea pigs because uh, last winter we had this course where i just irene and i just finished working with this ideas and got to try it out on them and this is what happened it was very encouraging for us so why don't you guys come up and share My name is Chandi, and I'm from the Seattle community. And um, this is Ashley, uh, Machen, and Heather. And one of our teachers is um, no longer with us, but we have her notes. They were excellent. She was our preschool teacher. Um, Susan McGinnis had asked us, it, I think it was in the spring sometime, To We had started our play with Kathleen on John Muir. And um, she'd asked us to create a curriculum. And then we 
simultaneously took this class and so it all kind of just dovetailed together. But to be honest with you, we did it on our own, uh, but how it came out was so beautiful. And I think that's the answer to your question, Kathleen, was we didn't always coordinate with each other on every aspect of it until the end. And then you can see the beauty of, of how it all came together. Um, so when the subject is well chosen, a play, which ours was, can also provide um, important exposure to noble ideals and actions. The courage to explore one's destiny, sacrifice in the pursuit of a goal, service to the greater cause that w is one's own comfort, follows one's own conscience and connection with the whole of life. John Muir and exemplified these qualities so beautifully. As the children hear the lines and practice the songs, the words can become part of their toolbox of attitudes to draw upon as life unfolds and offers them choices and tests. Oh, I'll be the one. Okay, how can your topic be used to provide motivation for your students' personal growth, um, expansion, courage, interaction with adults, developing concentration, building willpower, sharpening the mind, choosing happiness? Do you want me to elaborate on those at all? Yeah. Okay, so um, the play, which, which was the original kind of starting point of everything, because I think we started in January with the play, and it wasn't until springtime and we'd already kind of got into the play but not you know so deep into the play that Susan asked us to you know can we elaborate more on John Muir on the play and incorporate it in our curriculum so mine personal development a lot um, courage was one of the things because not everyone is a natural born actor in the play some kids are shyer than others and so it makes a lot of the kids step outside their com their comfort zones um, interaction with adults, obviously we had our drama teacher and they had um, interactions with not only their teachers but the drama teacher as well. Um, developing concentration, obviously for the play itself, de developed a lot of concentration. You had to know your part, you had to know other people's parts, you had to know how your part related to other people's parts and um, de um, building willpower, sharpening the mind and choosing happiness. Um, some of the things um, ex um, for personal development um, I had expanding sensitivity and um, we did a lot because we have a bus this year we got to really expand on the nature with John Muir we took a lot of nature awareness trips in the bus um, my particular age group went to the Olympic rainforest and we had a camp over so we really immersed ourselves in nature and we had done a lot of study with John Muir in the beginning so we were really there for that purpose to really connect um, and the play helped us do that too and um, working with others interaction cultivating courage uh, we did study a lot of, of John Muir and his following his dreams and what that means for personal growth for yourself also and having those connections in nature and having um, personal goals for yourself um, and building willpower, um, persistence. It took a lot of work for this play, a lot of work, and it took a lot of out of our classroom time, but we were persistent and everybody worked hard and everybody um, came together. And so there was a lot of cooperation and willpower that was, that was needed for that. In the preschool end of it, um, she related her um, curriculum through, because most of the books about John Muir were, were very abstract, the ones that I had found and the ones that she had found. So she took a whole nature element to it and developed the um, sense of responsibility of how nature and the sense of responsibility in the classroom work together. And so that's how she uh, coordinated it. And she, throughout the whole um, program, 
it was so obvious because the children, the little ones, were so focused um, and watching the older ones, too. So it just, the way she brought nature into the classroom, but also coordinating with the play, even though they didn't really get John Muir that much. Um, they, these are little guys. These are like twos and threes um, and beginning four-year-olds. So it was really beautiful the way she did that. Um, they did a lot of seed germinating and sprouting um, and, um, and then moved outside um, with planters and observed their growth as well as the plant's growth. All right, and then for understanding people, um, obviously we were, uh, John Muir was the topic, so we studied the life of John Muir. Um, who was he? How did his inventions affect our lives? Um, it really was an organic process because to be honest, I didn't know a lot about John Muir myself, so um, I was learning right along with the students. Um, he taught us to listen in nature through his, his experiences. Uh, we got to study uh, migrating to America, setting up homesteads, um, women's roles at the time, uh, age-appropriate books. I, I believe uh, Chandi's class read the story of John Muir and Squirrel. Um, all of the children memorized uh, many songs uh, and poems. Um, Oh, I already mentioned the homesteads and women's roles. Oh, passing uh, bills and laws and understanding government. Um, President Roosevelt and how he played a key role. And then one that I didn't get a chance to do, but um, I had come up with the idea later, was having the students, um, you know, John Muir uh, inspired the Sierra Club. And so I wish I would have, and if we do this again, um, developing their own conservation club, uh, uh, something that's important to them, and how to save the polar bears or something to that extent. So um, we got to do a lot of this, uh, but not everything that we came up with. So. Hi, I'm Heather, and I'm the primary teacher at Living Wisdom School, and I'll be talking about how our school worked with um, this topic in cooperation. And um, naturally, the students had to work together in cooperation for the play. We had preschool through eighth graders coming together and um, having a different part in the play. And so uh, what we did was we teamed the older students with younger students and had them do some coaching and some mentorship and helping those little ones, preschool age, um, learn the songs and my class the primary class actually worked with the preschool and they developed a dance together for the song lightly i fly and it was it was precious and um, we also used cooperation in multi-age groups um, creating murals and sets for the play and um, actually moving the props during the play they had to really coordinate and work together because that is huge. It's huge to orchestrate not just the acting and the singing and the dancing, but where do we physically go on the stage and how do I move around all these other people and put these props into place? And it was, it was beautifully um, done through cooperation. Um, in the preschool class, they did a unit on bees. And at our, um, at our farm, our Ananda farm, our, our main farmer, uh, Zach, has taught us, you know, to develop bee consciousness. And so what that means is learning how to know what your role is, you know, what's your purpose in any task, but in, in this play in particular, you know, what, what are you, what's your part? And the children in the preschool observed bees and beehives and colonies and really got to see how bees work together and how that's an essential part of nature and human nature too. Um, and when we, we studied this and did the online presentation with, with Nitai and the class, he mentioned, you know, wouldn't it be something if, if, you know, at the government level, we could get people to cooperate in, in this manner like bees do, you know, bee consciousness in the political realm would open a lot of doors. And so I think that's, that's all I have to say about cooperation. 
want to do the preschool part? Didn't I just? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just did that. <clears throat> Communication and self-expression. Um, John Muir taught us how to listen in nature, nature. Our children took their experiences outside creating journals, drawing plants, animals, um, and uh, made up stories. Um, I came up with, I've got, I had some pretty advanced kindergartners that were on a second grade level. So I created, um, we were doing kind of an offshoot of a frog unit. And we explored um, a frog habitat that a woman up in the Northwest um, puts together. She's called the Frog Lady, and it's, it's a big thing. So we did this whole offshoot of a frog um, unit. And um, I was creating um, storybook problems based on what would happen with a frog hopped out, how many left, um, and that kind of thing. It was, it was fun. Um, the children, my children also got really involved when they listened to the John Muir story about the president because there was a section in there about Roosevelt and they wanted to know who he was and I had no idea that they were going to do that. So, and then we were also doing math with um, counting um, pennies and nickels and um, dimes and quarters and that. So they wanted to know each one of those presidents and so uh, we had a little offshoot of that. So see, you never know what's gonna happen in your curriculum when you're in the middle of it and how you have to be on your feet to um, do some thinking about how you're gonna cover that subject. Um, uh, we also did nature poems in the upper elementary. Quotes and mandalas were created by the middle school, which were beautiful that hung on the walls. Um, alphabet quality charts and alphabet letters were drawn in watercolor and created from expressions in nature by the middle um, classroom. They had this chart, I just loved it. It was, um, a through Z, and then all the different qualities of nature. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. um, that reflected, and it was they were gorgeous. Um, I didn't take a picture of those. Uh, children memorizing poems from, um, from John Muir. Um, animals research um, reports and oral presentations, which my class did an oral presentation for the older kids based on their frog unit and what happened, and that was a really big thing for them. Um, and in the preschool, she uh, listened to stories um, and discussed, um, uh, she says here, she said, what was on our minds and conversational learning. In yoga, they pretend to be insects and plants and animals. And in art, we painted what we felt and modeled with Play-Doh. I think these are some of the pictures of the children um, in doing their sets. And um, so you can see this was John Muir as a, as a young boy off to the right. And then this, um, one thing that was really well done, which the children didn't even know was happening until the night of the play, there was a 3D component in the back of, of the stage. And that was um, reflected. So here he's like climbing this, um, structure there, but it was like over the sea, or um, the very first slide, I don't know if you saw, but he was in the forest, or he'd be in, by a stream. It was just magical, and they reflected on, on the screen, and it just took the breath away of everyone that was in the crowd. It was just added that extra element that, um, and the children were like, they had no idea that that was going to happen, so... <laughs> it was really great and these are some of the poems that were done um, the spring poems from Ashley's class and the artwork and I just love this one over here worms out of the ground really close to nature my cat wants to eat them <laughs> our earth our universe um, so got opportunities to study the cycles of life, new spring life, uh, rhythm in nature, rhythm in life, um, classifying plants and animals, uh, studying national parks, uh, inventions with sharpening the mind, uh, activities that gave the, um, I think the first one we did was I gave them just a tin can and they made inventions what this tin can could be. It could be a phone and um, a jar to put your 
belongings in, but the fun one was the popcorn machine. It um, became a, a hair dryer and an egg incubator. And um, so just giving them an everyday item and then seeing what they can come up with, um, what inventions they can come up with. Uh, we studied animal reproduction. Uh, one of the classes, who brought in the pond water? Was that me? Chandi's class? Uh, had uh, their science teacher bring in pond water and uh, looking at the, uh, the pond water under a microscope um, on a large screen, which was fascinating to me as well. Um, new plants discovered in the wild during the middle school camp out. I think they had Keith, a uh, nature awareness teacher, um, showing them edible plants and uh, he's extremely we, knowledgeable. We, we had pan fried in my iron skillet, pan fried baby fern fronds and they yeah. were so <laughs> good. They were just tender and sweet and then we went out and picked more the next day so we could have them for breakfast the next day because the kids all liked them. <laughs> um, Chandi, as she mentioned, uh, exploring with the frog lady. Um, opportunity, we got to study, you know, uh, John Muir walking across these glacier, glaciers and the avalanche that he was uh, in, so studying natural disasters. Um, and then the uh, conservation club, like I mentioned, the Sierra Club. And this is just the preschool. I, I really loved the way she um, made it practical for them about their um, being disappointed because some of their their little ant or their their plants didn't survive, and so she took that inward and like how did they feel about that? So I thought that was really sweet, feeling disappointed and and then joyfulness, um, and then respecting space for each other. So wholeness. <clears throat> The completion of the project, the reflection of the middle school, and how it related to the children, and the a powerful documentary that Machen did afterwards. She took um, a video um, that she had found, and she's always liked to have that circle of how it relates back to kids now and how John Muir really affected them. So she had a video that she showed about the 300 mile trail and it was a, um, a video that was done by um, a high school class. And I think there was maybe eight hikers and a couple um, older, I don't know if they were the teachers or just guides, but they're actual doing the John Muir tour, the, the whole thing. And so they got to see all the challenges. They ran out of food because you, they were mile points where they could pick up food. People could drop off food for them or mail food to the places. And, just the, all the hardships that they, they, you know, they lost gear and going through rivers and they, you know, d ran out of food. I mean, they had the same types of things that would happen back in those days. But to make, for my kids, if I don't make things relevant to today, they sort of get lost and think, oh, that's, that was in the old days and that's, you know, that's not part of my life now or our life in today's world. But to show that you can still hike that same trail that they, you know, hiked that many years ago. Maybe things are a little bit different. You have a better backpacks and better GPSs and better, <laughs> be, better things, but you know, still it's the it's same, so you're taking those same steps on that same ground. And, and, in, and finding out there are a lot of hardships to making it. Can you imagine how hard it was, you know, way back then when there wasn't really trails and they had to blaze the trails and, you know, just make it relevant. Nitai asked us to, how did this, how was this really real for the kids? What, how did it affect their consciousness? And he kept saying that through our class quite a few times. So I, I took it upon myself to actually interview the children. I went around to everybody in the school and asked them what they got out of the play. And so here's some of the comments. In the pre-K kindergarten class, he helped protect the parks. He taught us about nature. He taught us about inventions and machinery. And one of the girls said, when you take something in nature, it affects everything else, which she's only five. Um, the first and second graders, not to kill animals, respect nature. Uh, helps me to make um, be uh, save the trees. 
um, the courage to be who I am. Um, in fourth and fifth grade, I'm going to save up my money so I can buy some tree seeds and plant them. I want to take care of nature more. When I go outside, I can be happy and how it affects my life. Um, middle schoolers. <clears throat> he was a person who started all the natural for, um, parks. He never gave up and just kept giving. Um, one um, fellow said, I have had these ideas in my head, and I was so inspired that he was a creator and an inventor, and it gave me the confidence, which I thought was a really sweet way. One story I just have to end with, and it, it kind of um, reflects on the whole um, experience for what the children received and what we as teachers try to be aware and be open to receive and taking that next step, even though it may not be exactly John Muir and I'm in this um, realm of, oh, I have to keep into this lesson plan. I had a, a young girl come into class and her mother writes the little notes every day um, in her lunch pail and I was sitting next to her and she opened this up and it's this big note and it said, love you forever and forever. And I just, I just started singing. And I said, do you know this is a song? And she's like, no. So I get my phone out and turn on, <laughs> excuse me, Paul McCartney. And we start singing it. And she starts crying. I start crying. And I decided during this whole time, my children didn't actually learn Dare to be Different because they were learning this song. And um, it was just too much. They were five-year-olds and it was just too many words. Dare, Dare to be Different is one of my favorites, but it has a lot of words. So, but afterwards, I was in my meditation room and I came out and it, this was just going on in my head for weeks and weeks, this song. And for many of us who are at Ananda, there is a, a, a ceremony that we go to, a secret ceremony, and we say, I will. And I was walking out of my meditation room and I went, I will. And listen to the words of this. Um, this actually was written in um, Ravikish. And it was actually after many hours of meditation. I just read this last night. You know how long I've loved you. You know I love you still. Well, I wait a lonely lifetime. If you want me to, I will love you forever and forever love you with all my heart love you whenever we're together love you when we're apart and when at last i find you your song will fill the air sing it loud so i may hear you make it easy to be near you for the things you do endear you to me Oh, all you know, I will, I will. And they sang this at our parent gathering, and there was not an eye, dry eye in the house. It was, it was gorgeous. So you just never know where the energy is going to lead you, and, and, and you just got to go with it. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. That was beautiful, and it showed showed me that the, the potential when the classes start to work together, you know, and, and really try to build on their each other's energy. I think uh, just just in terms of it's just so easy to get locked into your own classroom, and you forget that there's all other kinds of things happening in your school, and it just enriches it to pull it all together. So thanks for sharing all that. <laughs> so Carol, I was going to ask you to share your game next. And I can't remember right now how this got started, Carol. You'll have to fill me in. But anyways, um, Ridai, do you want to help her with the table? Are you going to come over here or do you want to, do you want to talk from there? Um, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Is the table going to make it? 
Uh, I think, yeah, we can, maybe we can stand and hold up one side of it. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about, you know, how do we integrate life skills in more traditional curriculum? Um, and so she had this idea, and then the idea kept evolving, and it became a game, and here she is to tell us about it. <laughs> Yeah, the one leg is a little. Are you going to talk from there, that side, Carol? Uh, I can come up. Okay. So this started in the winter, and it turned out to be a much bigger project than I think either one of us thought. Um, the idea was could I take um, some of the core curriculum standards and um, some of the standards that Swami wrote down and actually build bridges, a bridge, into the life skills. So I wasn't working with children. That was the hard part. So it had to kind of be, you know, my own idea of what I thought might work. And I got a lot of coaching. We kept going back, you know, Nitai, we did some Skyping, lots of Skyping. He would say, well, what about this skill? What about this skill? And I tried to hit as many as I could. So the idea then of the game is that it would be sort of a foundation piece that maybe you could use with children. And then just from that point, um, expand on the things that they really uh, took to in that particular game. So um, we decided to do geology. I decided to do geology. And try to give the children some ideas about geology and then how it might affect, uh, how it affects their world. And OK, so from there. And I realized I needed a, a human interest element. So I live on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. And it's built around things that I've experienced. And so uh, I took the Fisher project. Now the Fisher is a little mammal, kind of like a weasel, that was trapped out of, of the Olympic National Forest and the Olympic National Park. And about more than a decade ago, the biologists got together and they decided that it was an important part of the ecosystem and they wanted to reintroduce it. But they were all gone. And so they were still being trapped in Canada and British Columbia, which was not too far away. So they worked out something with the Canadian government and the trappers that instead of trapping a fisher and getting, this is what I heard, I haven't exactly seen this on paper, instead of getting uh, $40 for a pelt, that they could have $600 if they would go through the experience of, tri of trapping a live fisher and return it. Uh, and so uh, a big process, they've been working on it for years, and the idea was to get a breeding population of about 100 fishers back in Olympic National Park where they would be protected. So this was the idea. So and I have on the front, um, that they would be student scientists and they were being invited to go into Olympic National Park and uh, check some of the stations. And now, because the collars, the um, radioactive collars have fallen off the fissures, um, they are being tracked with hair snare stations where they have a little box with little combs that come down and, and they put chicken in it, okay? And the animals visit the box, and some of the hair is there. And they can actually do DNA to find out who visited the box and what their lineage is. So, and by the way, they had more than 40 different animals visit the boxes, which is pretty incredible. And so then this is just, uh, it's a picture. I love the faces. You might want to come up and look at it later of an actual Fisher release where they brought it back, and everybody's standing there peering at it. So, um, so then to try to create this simulation, which is what it needed to be, I made a collage, which kind of ma uh, matches the park. And there are 
brochure is here. You can see a map of the park. And so there are so many geological possibilities in Olympic National Park. You've got glaciers, you've got uh, high mountains. You know, are they young mountains or old mountains? You've got a seashore with sand. You know, how long does it take to grind down the mountains to make sand? You've got um, glacier fields where there are glacier, glacial rubble where um, the glacier comes along when it melts, it drops a lot of rocks. Okay, those are hard to hike over. There are also glacial slicks where um, the ground is just totally smoothed out. You know, is that a safe place to walk? And then you've got, of course, the forest, and we've got some animals. There's a bear over here, and there's a fisher box with a, an actual photograph of a fisher. So the students then, um, they start here at the trailhead, and they're divided into four teams. Um, so you could do it with any number, you could do it with four kids, you could do it with 12 kids. And as they go along, the trails are color coded, but when they start, the ranger comes and gives them a little talk and tells them a little bit about things that they need to remember along the trail. So um, first it says there will be a reward in camp, <laughs> this was Irene's idea for all those who can recall and explain the structure of our Earth, including the formation of tectonic plates. And so they're walking along the trail, somebody picks up a card and they read it. Our Earth is, I won't go through all the cards, but these first ones are kind of critical. Our Earth is made up of layers, kind of like an ice cream sandwich. It's hard on the outside and soft in the middle. And then they go further and they get this card. The rock in the center of the earth is so hot, it's melted or molten. And surrounding this melted layer is a hard uh, layer of rock, but it's cracked into several giant pieces called tectonic plates. The tectonic plates slide around on the soft layer beneath. They move about two inches a year our west coast, this is your coast and our coast, is the leading edge of a huge tectonic plate called the continental plate. Before you start this hike, look at the markers for your trail. Follow them in your mind and concentrate on the terrain you will move through. What will it look like and feel like to follow this path? So then they start out, they've got, this is another one of Irene's ideas, she says, we need to get some numbers into this. <laughs> so there's a lot of measuring. They come across a bear track and they measure it. They see a large bird with a wingspan of almost eight feet, you know, how big is their span? And as they go, uh, they throw the die, they move along, they get a card, and um, they're a little person who's all are also color-coded to move. And so what to say about it from there? These are some ideas. They have a safety talk with their teacher before they leave. Um, there are camp notes for the teacher. Everybody ends up with their group ending up at camp. And there are things they write about, you know, their experiences, they come up with adjectives to describe what they've seen. Um, and uh, the ranger gives them a talk at the very beginning, talking about the fact that they're in nature's family, how should they behave, you know, quietly, especially approaching the fisher stations. Um, and and then some expansion ideas, because I really think this is only a launching point, um, that they come back with the teacher and they find out where were they grabbed with this? What would they like to know more about? There's a lot about the human body in this, how they feel is um, this particular trail, the blue trail, goes up into the mountains, so they're doing some rather difficult hiking as they go and um, they need to stop and drink water. They all need to stop and drink water and eat food and 
um, share food with others, and if they haven't had enough to drink, uh, or they forgot to bring their water filter and they're out of water, they need to rest in the shade and lose a point, lose a turn. Um, and things about, you know, climbing up into the mountains, what do they see when they get here? They can look down and see the view and see how expansive it is and how does that feel. Um, there are decision points down here where the bear is in the tree. Um, they walk along and they can either take a trail. They were told that by another hiker, this is one of the cards, that somebody's seen a bear in the area and, um, and there's another trail that might be a shortcut, but the trail is hard to follow. So they can either kind of take the safe way and go around or they can try the shortcut and they get lost in that case and they have to backtrack with the idea. It's always a good idea to follow a known trail in wilderness. Um, and here they can make a decision either trying to cut across the glacial slick. They might lose the trail again or really to go around. Anyway, um, so... What do you know that you didn't know before? What questions came up that we can learn about together? Picture yourself on a real hike in a similar environment and write a story about it. Uh, here are some topics that might be of interest. Hiking in wilderness and at altitude. So there's some things about altitude. We go into the notion of tectonic plates, how one is sliding under the other. We're uh, up there, everybody's going, you know, there's supposed to be maybe a, a, a nine, level nine earthquake up there at some time because the stresses are building and uh, the Pacific plate is sliding under the continental plate and so the stresses are building. To use their hands after they look at a diagram and show uh, what that looks like. Um, foods that give energy while you exercise. There's quite a bit about tracking animal tracks, uh, the importance of having a water filter. That's one of the things. Uh, the idea, before they go, they come up with a list of all the things they might need on the hike, and they don't have anything else when they get out there. So, um, and I think probably real food that they take along, so they get to eat snacks at different points. Um, learning about the range of mountains and what forces might have created them. So the tectonic plates create the mountains and how is that done? What the results are when an animal is missing from an ecosystem, glaciers and why they move, the tree line, famous geologists and how they changed our view of the earth, sketching animals, writing the life history of a fisher from its point of view, learning about the true stories of famous explorers of wilderness, John Wesley Powell, John Muir, Lewis and Clark. So um, just a thought as a way to launch as a bridge between uh, a rather stiff academic curriculum uh, and, a, and childhood experiences that then could be expanded. Um, so you're welcome to come up. The thing about it, I have not played this with children. And um, it would be really fun to get some feedback if anybody has time and wants to come up and um, actually try playing the game. So. So if you're actually in the classroom, you don't have time to make a game like this, but she, Carol, had the time and she made it. So anybody who would like to utilize it, talk to her and I bet we can ship it around the different schools and people could uh, try it out and give feedback. It'd be kind of a prototype for creating materials that could be just EFL game materials or just a different, on different topics. So it's, uh, thank you, Carol, for all that work. It was <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, our last speaker before lunch is gonna be Matthew. He's gonna talk about journaling and lesson planning. <laughs> Does anybody need to stretch? Let's stand up. Well, you don't have to, but perhaps you can stand and we can do the full yogic breath. Stand up on the tips of your toes. 
And relax down. Or do something else. <laughs> and breathe up. Just move. <laughs> Whatever it is. And another breath down. And inhale. Ah, okay. A little bit better? All right. Well, my name is Matthew, and I'm the middle school teacher at our Portland school. And I'm going to talk briefly. I'll try to keep it brief because I think we're a little bit, um, a little bit over time, just about how to, how to tune in to that theme. Uh, you know, we've had all these different tools about how to develop it, um, bringing the life skills in, but how do you how do you actually decide what that might be uh, for a group of children in front of you that you've already uh, gotten to know on a personal level? But then, uh, as you all know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There's uh, individual energy that you get from each student. But then, what are they like as a group? And then, furthermore, what are their needs as a group? So, I thought it might be. Uh, helpful to bring the children in to our uh, awareness. So why don't we, why don't you just close your eyes for a minute. Uh, most of you are classroom teachers. For those of the, you that aren't, like Nitai and others have said, this, these principles can be applied in so many ways. Maybe it's with colleagues, family members, or, or anyone you interact with. But just bring, if, if you're a school teacher, bring your children into your awareness, see their faces, their smiling faces, their eyes looking at you. <laughs> and ask the question, who are, these, who are these kids? Who are these children? What are their interests? What are their needs as a group? What can I share with them that would inspire, that would expand their consciousness? What are the lessons here needed, not only for each individual, but for the class? Just hold that in your awareness for a moment. And as we continue, just keep, keep these young people or whoever in your awareness as we go. Because, yeah, you, we need to start with the people that are there in front of us, the young people or, or whoever it is. Um, and asking those questions uh, first. Uh, so I think I won't use the board because I think it would just take a lot of time. But I, I was thinking of, of how, to, how to plan as four or five roads that converge into an intersection. Uh, and then from there, tuning in to what, what the theme might be or what the topic might be. Uh, for myself, I kind of like, and my class happens to also like, that things tie back to a specific theme for a little while at least. They, they uh, middle schoolers, my middle schoolers anyway, they like the variety of different topics, but also how do they all interrelate? So I try to get something specific for at least a couple of, of weeks. And then everything, you know, as we all shared, it ties together, different curriculum areas overlap, but it all ties back to the wholeness um, aspect of in individual, uh, their individual realities. So if you can, if you can put your, oh wait, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. So the roads, the interests and needs of your students, uh, they may want to watch uh, Desperate Housewives, was it? <laughs> or, uh, or practice putting on makeup, but they don't, they don't need, that's probably not a need that they have. So, so what our role is, part of our role, is to tune into what, what is the needs? What are the needs? And there may be more than one, but uh, I've found, and you probably have found too, that there might be uh, you know, something specific, some overarching need, some lesson that needs to be learned, something they all need to uh, express or confront, uh, you know, most of them anyway, and that's, that's just sort of, it sort of hangs there, and it, it's just waiting. It, you know, if you don't resonate with that term, what's trying to happen, that's okay, but realize that there is something that wants to express. You know, if, if, 
if we have our energy um, you know, at the highest it can be, it's gonna lift theirs up and something will want to come in and be expressed through you as the teacher and through them and, and really those relationships that we talked about earlier as the foundation, they feel comfortable uh, expressing hurts and expressing concerns. Uh, and then often it's those real immediate things that they're facing in life that, that uh, want to be translated and expressed um, in the classroom. So if you can put your minds back to late fall, early winter of last year, uh, a lot of people were uh, confused, upset, uh, afraid. Um, my students certainly were. And they talked about, every day they talked about uh, the you know, results of our election and oh, how could this happen? And oh, we can't believe it, it's the end of the world. You know, they thought it was gonna be the end of the world. And I, I, tried to, I tried to put the most positive spin on it I could and just encourage them to think positive and you know, this, this whole thing isn't without precedent. You know, there's been lousy leaders for you know, millenniums. <laughs> there will continue to be. Uh, but then some good ones too. But uh, what finally happened was um, they couldn't. They needed to confront it, and they needed to be reassured that everything was going to be okay. That there was actually hope. Um, that it wasn't the end of the world. That uh, that that there's. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for, but there there is precedent. Things like this have happened before. So what happened was we. Um, we discovered this book called A Night Divided, okay? And it's about, um, it's historical fiction about the Cold War era, specifically about Berlin during, during the Cold War era. And the fact that they actually built this wall that divided a city, that divided families, and somehow thought this was a good idea um, so they were just fascinated by this idea. I think, in retrospect, it was sort of a way of approaching the immediate issue, kind of obliquely, uh, you know, uh, or from a distance, seeing that, uh, well, eventually seeing that how um, not only the wall, but the whole idea of that just sort of collapsed under its own, the weight of its own negativity. You know, so I think it gave them a lot of just hope that things will be okay. Uh, so, so with that book coming in, we, I thought, I thought it was going to be a unit on the Cold War era, and that's how I kind of started with it. It's going to be all about the Cold War, and we like our units to be thematic, and I like to include as many things as I can. So it includes. Uh, history, it includes geography, it includes literature, any, everything I can include in one, uh, in one unit, I, I try to do that. But I, uh, now I can make these, these available, I, I can make copies, uh, I'm not just pulling this out of the air, this is from the old uh, Education for Life teacher manual, and it takes you step by step into just what we've been talking about uh, today already, just uh, getting, you know, getting to know your students, but then getting to know uh, their interests, their needs, again, your own uh, interests, your own knowledge, what you're enthusiastic about teaching. I, I, I got off of my road analogy, but that, that was one of the roads, was the, your, your own knowledge, your own expertise, what, you're, uh, what you yourself are excited about teaching, even though sometimes, obviously, you know, with the John Muir uh, unit, some of you didn't know much about him, but you knew that it was, it was going to happen anyway, so you, you learned, you know, with the students. So it doesn't always have to be something you know about, but anyway, that often helps as a start. Uh, but then, but then tuning into the deeper essence of whatever it is you're trying to present, because if you can do that, then you won't mind so much if all your lessons just go out the window, because uh, 
you know, the students grab onto something else or they're more fascinated by this and you go down this other road. But if, if you have a destination in mind and it's not the, it's not the subject, it's the, deeper, it's the deeper lesson or the qualities you want them to learn, uh, as long as you know that's where you're going, there's different ways you can get there. So at any rate, um, I'll read you. So these, you might want to write these down, these questions, but uh, I can also get you copies. So in part two of planning a unit, the first question is, what is the essence of the topic I've chosen? And then this, this kind of makes you think. On the deepest level, why is this topic worth teaching? And right now I'm thinking, okay, Cold War era, what's the deeper essence of it? And so what I wrote was, I, I think it's essentially about compassion. Surpri I don't know where that came from, but surprisingly, that, that's, that's what I thought. I think it's about compassion, kindness, acceptance. It's about realizing our shared humanity, despite our differences, but that we must fight for truth. So I think that last part is, um, we can accept uh, certain points of view. We can accept people, our students, um, for what they are. We can accept that things are happening in the world. But we can also, without judging, we can also recognize that they're wrong, all right? Uh, the wall going up in, in Berlin at that time, there were people who, um, you know, recognize that it, you, you don't do this. This is wrong. You don't put up a wall. Uh, you don't tear apart families. Uh, and, but you can you can say that, and you can recognize. This is what I wanted them to understand. You can recognize something's wrong, but not get all agitated and judgmental. But, you, but stand for instead of fighting against the wrong things by yelling at them or throwing things at them, standing for what is right, standing for truth, and letting that shine instead of instead of fighting against wrong, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so there was that. And then number two was, <clears throat> excuse me, what vibration do I want to convey? What vibration do I want to convey? I had to really tune in to that, because that, that's a tough question. What, what vibration do I, what does that mean, first of all? Um, and I think uh, what I finally got to is what's the consciousness behind what I'm trying to share here. So with this topic, uh, empathy is what I wrote. Empathy, calmness, fortitude in the face of adversity, and using uh, intuitive wisdom as opposed to emotional reactivity. So we, we have plenty of emotional reactivity in our world today, uh, but not a lot of intuitive wisdom. So hel helping them understand that was what I, one thing I wanted. Um, Okay, number three, how do I want my students to feel during this topic? So giving that some thought beforehand, what, what do I want them to be feeling? Um, so for that, I, I want them to feel that there are absolute universal truths, is what I wrote, uh, that we must defend by standing united with those who share our ideals and having compassion for and seeing common ground with those who oppose us. Uh, I would pray that at the very least it would help them further develop empathy, kindness, and acceptance is what I wanted them to feel in, in studying this topic. Um, okay, so anyway, in conclusion, I guess, it, the, um, we studied the facts, we studied the, the geography, the history, you know, some aspects of the Cold War era persist now, you know, as we all know. Uh, so it's relevant now, but, you know, trying, trying to tie it in to things they're facing now. So in their personal lives. So I think with that particular unit, which lasted a couple weeks, um, I think it did help them to uh, be able to cooperate better with each other. We had different activities where they were in separate groups and they had to come to, you know, a peaceful compromise, you know, not let's put up a wall, but how can we, how can we compromise without compromising our ideals, which that, that, that's a pretty lofty ideal and that's not easy to teach, but you can at least try to get them to move in that direction. Um, at any rate, any, any questions about that or any thoughts? Uh, yeah. 
Yes. The whole year, yes. but a lot during that time, just, you know, things kept happening more and more. And finding ways um, to help them with that was, was challenging. So I wonder what was that? How did you feel once the it was over, the unit was over? Did you, did they calm down much? Or did you see anything around that was different? They did, they did calm down. I think it was a combination of that plus just time, you know. But... Uh, it, it's just, I mean, you all know, it's interesting how things just happen. I mean, one of my students brought in the book, you know, and said, maybe we could read this. And I thought, hmm, yes, maybe we could. And once we got into it, they were just so, maybe they didn't even know why it was so fascinating <clears throat> to read about Berlin in 1940, you know, 45 to 50. But, <clears throat> you know, we all soon... <clears throat> excuse me, realized that, that that's what it really was. It was confronting this other issue, but from a, a bit of a distance because it was so hard to, hard to accept at the time for, for many of them anyway. So, yeah, I think it did help a lot. It's ongoing, it's ongoing. yeah, sure, sure. Um, anyhow, yeah, I would just encourage you to ask these, these deeper questions and uh, just, you know, as we've all said, as we all know, you plan for a certain thing, but then if something else comes up, it's no big deal. You can take that other road as long as you know where you're going, <laughs> vibrationally speaking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.